So welcome everyone Hi. to the community call of 3rd November 2022. And yeah, first thing on the agenda, stream 032 is released. So, uh, so yeah, I guess we can celebrate instead of meeting. Uh, Thanks to everyone who contributed to it and thanks to everyone who helped to test it and so on. And then I guess for the rest of the meeting, we should decide if we want to try to finish this Trumzy survey questions or if we want to go first through the regular agenda. Anyone has any strong opinions? I think that I missed one of the latest community meeting. Uh, is there uh, much more left there or we are <laughs> almost at the end? It never seems like there's much more left, but it always takes longer than expected. I guess this is where we continue. Okay, now I cannot switch back to that other topic because of the Zoom UI. <sighs> yeah, I guess these five points are the last remaining ones. Okay, I guess since I already opened it, we should go through it. So I need to understand how the code base is structured, not familiar with the operator pattern and documentation, lack of clear examples. So on that <laughs> first one, um, there was a recording of a discussion that we had of me sort of explaining how I approach the code base, where I think things are. Um, but I don't think we ever then put that out publicly. Um, but it's certainly something that I still have in my mind to try and get a public video that just kind of talks through like, here's where different things are. If you're getting started, here's a starting point. Um, you know, this is how you find stuff. So for example, if you want to know what stage in the reconcile you're in, like this is how to walk through. So that's definitely something that's still, um, I'd still like to try and create at some point. Um, and hopefully that will help with at least people understanding a bit more how the code base is structured. And I guess alongside that, I could write some sort of um, write up that we could put in the repo as well. I guess the issue is it getting out of date. So I don't know if the write up would be better as a blog post so that it's a bit more of a um, statement of current point in time rather than a piece of documentation that we have to keep an eye on. Okay. That sounds like something that could be useful. Anyone yeah, has anything else? I like agree. This? Thanks, Kate. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I was I had issues with my mic. Uh, one thing that I definitely would also find very useful um, because the video um, walkthrough was also very useful is to add some input, probably in a form of some documentation. Um, comparing the, I don't know, convention in Strimzy to the convention in maybe in Kubernetes or something like that, because I think some people, at least I myself face that, like uh, the Go side of Kubernetes have some differences with what we have here. Um, so things like, for example, the operator, uh, things that are called operators, uh, some of them 
I, 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 I think they are like clients, like, I don't know, stream Z pod set client, and instead of being stream Z pod set operator. Um, how we do the, 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 the walkthrough for the, from the CRD to the controller is also useful. Like something that we can focus on, um, whether in the video or in a blog post is, this is an example of, a, I think the streams deposit is a good example for that. Um, this is an example of a new CRD that we have. Here's how the CRD is generated. Here is what it, the controller and what it, what it means. Um, and here is what we call a reconciler. Um, and this is, if you wanna, and here's where in the codes um, you can create like, what is called clients in, 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 in the goal, like here's the streams deposit clients, which is here is called here's streams deposit operator. I don't know what you folks feel about that, but for me, this like um, this picture, I had to kind of like build it in pieces and figure out what this means and was all trying to, I think I had a, also like a, I, I, I didn't see this, the Java side of um, Kubernetes before and uh, had the, like an assumptions. Okay, so there must be somewhere where there are the CRD types, but then they were, you know, generated and stuff. And yeah, this is on, on my end that, that not every, like not, it's not the same everywhere, which is normal. I don't think there is any Java side of Kubernetes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I that's every, also probably every, part everyone, of my. Everyone does. Whatever yeah, they yeah. Do. yeah, that's part of my wrong assumptions. I would, I would think, but yeah, I think I would imagine that there are folks who would be contributing. But I'm not sure how important this is to be honest. But like, if there are folks who are contributing and coming from writing Go-based controllers. Because since you know the Kubernetes client is uh, fr from Cube is Go, so there is like things that are, they're used to. You know, ah, I have the CRD, so I need to look for the client for the CRD. I have this uh, stuff like that. But it's there's a reason why it's Java and not Go, right? It's I understand. I'm not saying. I'm not saying this is this. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. That's where we, I think we can help people understand how it's not the same, you know, how things are here and why they're like that. I'm not saying that we should follow that convention. I'm just saying maybe one of the reasons somebody might think, yeah, I, I need more help in understanding the code. But yeah, that's also presuming for whoever gave this feedback or if such people actually exist or not. What I can do actually, because um, I think this might make a better video anyway, is I'll have a go at some point at writing up a kind of script of what I'll say in the video, and then I can share that in Slack and get feedback from people. So if there are things that I understand to work in a, a way that doesn't make sense or that actually works differently, and then at that point, if um, people like yourself, Ahmed, who have experience with the Go-based one, think there are specific snippets that would be worth saying, oh, this is like such and such. If you were using the Go-based um, operator SDK, then yeah, we can add those in. And perhaps that would be the best way to kind of get a walk through that um, pulls in all, all the different sort of top tips that people have for exploring the code base. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Okay. Anyone has anything to the second part about the documentation and lack of clear examples? I guess we already discussed, didn't we, doing some sort of blog post or some sort of reach out to try and get more feedback on the documentation because we seem to get very mixed feedback and it's hard to know exactly what we're missing. Yeah, that blog post was already published for the road.
Okay, I guess this one pretty much falls to the previous one, right? I would really love to contribute to Streamzy, but I really don't know where to start. Sure, one of the previous comments was about good starter issues as well. What do you mean? Oh, you've just gone past it, I think. Stop. Yeah, don't be afraid. We have good start issues that can help which we can help you get started. There are also other ways of contributing other than just writing code. Ah, okay. So we can say that it's answered before. And um, we do have a contributing section on GitHub that links to the good start label and things like that. Okay. Operator setup required to test changes locally. Yeah, I mean to test changes to operator, you need to run the operator but I'm not sure what else to understand behind it, to be honest. No, because you can run all of the unit tests without having to have a Kubernetes or anything locally. Um, but like you say, if you want to actually test it in an integration type capacity or on a real cluster, then you need an operator running. We know that we can run the unit tests without a kube cluster but do we make that clearer enough in the readme or the contributing or whatever in the dev guide we tell you how to skip all of the tests i don't think we call out in the like getting initial build flow um, I'm just checking further down. We do have a section that talks about being able to skip the integration test, but I don't think it explicitly calls out the fact that the integration tests use a running Kubernetes. So I'd, we could potentially make that clear. Yeah, it sounds like an extra sentence or two in there probably wouldn't hurt just to explain that the unit tests don't, but the system tests and the integration tests do. Yeah, okay, but I'm not sure it really makes sense to, like we know that the unit tests are very limited in what, they can do and that the actual environment is very different right so is that really answer to the question that hey if you want to contribute just check the unit tests and open a pr and and whatever we will review it without you ever trying it and so on if you open a pr right ci should run all the tests so Maybe for some reason your machine can't run the test or you should be able to use the, the CI, right? So the CI runs all the tests, but like... <laughs> I don't know. I personally know the code base very well, I think, but I wouldn't open a PR without compiling the code and actually running it in a cluster, to be honest, unless it's really something absolutely 
like yeah changing the unit tests themselves doesn't need testing kubernetes cluster but yeah it makes sense that you know <laughs> it's unlikely your code will work unless you test it but uh, um you know if you make a i mean you if you make a small change or something that can be tested with unit tests if you don't have the capacity to run the full suite and you know, run Kubernetes on your machine, you can for that you can really run the CI. But obviously, the dev experience is terrible if you if you're making some significant change and you only get feedback through CI. I mean, the dev loop is awful. <laughs> well, that's also a terrible experience for the maintainers, right? Who get the notifications and are expected to review the PRs and so on. Some Can people open like graph? a draft. Yeah. Yeah. So I do often run the just the unit tests while I'm working on a change initially and then I'll test it fully at the end. Um once I think I've got it in a rough shape. I think you're right, Jakob, that perhaps we don't want to call out explicitly that it's fine to just run the unit tests. But I think the it, we could be clearer to people so that they understand which steps they need to run and not run in the build process in order to run different kinds of tests. Uh, I wonder if a video would be useful here as well or it can be part of it covered in Kate's video. Like, I definitely think that it's useful to have a video that shows, hey, that's how you start your local environment from scratch and go, oh, these are the different kind of tests. That's how you run them. That's, yes, you can run this locally, maybe even show that the process until opening a pull request, make sure that the, yeah, the pipelines are running and then someone from the maintainers will do this and that, and then there will be like regression tests happening, et cetera. I think the documentation as it stands is actually pretty good. Um, you know, I you know, raised my first PR against um, the Strimzy Kafka operator um, day before yesterday. And you know, I got through running you know, the operator setup and running the, the running the tests against the uh, against Minikube. That was all pretty easy, really. You know, I didn't need to question anybody. I just followed the instructions, and pretty much it all worked. Yeah, so what we do about this? Uh, so Tom and Kate will have a look into the developer docs if it's clear enough that the unit tests can be run without Kubernetes. Yeah, I can take a look. Thanks, Kate. I can review whatever you look at, come up with. I guess follow um, yeah, I was just going to say follow up question to what Keith said. Was it clear to you, Keith, how to run the different tests, or did you just run all the tests and with the Kubernetes, so you didn't have to worry about running a subset? I just ran all the tests. Okay. If I'm being one hundred percent frank. I don't think Keith, you're like a representative to a new contributor joining the project and trying to figure out how to run this. <laughs> yeah, but you know, all projects are different. You know, yeah, definitely. finding a dev guide finding a dev guide was quite easy, following the instructions in there to to get set up. You know, it was it was all, you know, I'm not saying there's no improvements that could be made, but I'm I'm saying that, you know, as a new person contributing to the project, 
it was actually reasonably straightforward. Um, you know, I had it all done in you know, less than 60 minutes. New with an asterisk. <laughs> well. <laughs> I've had far worse experiences. <laughs> okay, do we move to the next point? So lack of willingness to integrate with MSK, meaning Amazon MSK, I guess. So I think, Everyone who showed some interest to integrate, to contribute any integration with MSK. So first of all, as mentioned in the previous questions, our focus is not necessarily to make it easy to use Amazon MSK. Our focus is to run Kafka on Kubernetes. That's not exactly the same, but I think everyone who wanted to contribute something to integrate with MSK, we basically, gave them two options because we need to make sure that the project can be maintained and we can test the things and so on. Then, yeah, we can either work on adding the integration as a general customizable pluggable thing. And that way it's possibly useful for more users, but we can also test it because it doesn't depend on MSK or if someone wants to actually integrate tightly with MSK, then the start will be to explain how this can be tested if they contribute some test environments or some budgets for the test environments and so on. And that's usually the point where people get silent because yeah, they expect that they ask or even contribute a PR for some integration with MSK but we will somehow do everything else and keep testing it, keep maintaining it and so on. But to be honest, that's not really how, how it works. And we can't really test for every release some MSK integration without having the environments and so on. So that's why the possibility to do it as a pluggable thing or as a for example, the custom authorization we have and so on. That's the way how it can be done without any hard dependency on something like MSK and how it can be tested easily without any Amazon environments and so on. So that's always the other option. Just to make sure I understand this correctly. So is the ask here that all the managing creation and managing of the Kafka is done via the MSK APIs? Eventually, no, like. So I, I don't know more than what's stated here, but typically these things would be like directly support some custom authentication mechanisms, which Amazon MSK only supports and so on. Maybe they're discussing something like, also, I don't know, was this brought up before that somebody wants to use the topic operator or the user operator with MSK? That is relatively common, yes. It's not like everyone does that, but. Yeah, okay, so, so, so that, that's probably part of what does it mean by integrate with MSK? Well, it can mean other things, right? Like supporting MSK authentica MSK only authentication types in things like Mirror Maker, Connect, and so on. Okay, yeah, thanks.
Anything else to this? Okay, then the last question is mailing lists are underutilized. I would like to see discussions integrated with user mailing list and new issues and proposals with the deaf mailing list. Does Strimzy have mailing lists? You don't know about them? No. <laughs> there is a user and deaf mailing list. Uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't know they existed then, so. That's a bigger problem then. By the way, I don't know if we are, they are asking, for example, about proposal, if you, so do, for example, I know that, uh, so all we know that in Kafka, when you have to, in the Kafka upstream community, when you have to discuss the, so we keep, you are starting a thread on the mailing list and then all the discussions happens there. I'm not sure we want something similar because it seems that discussing on the PR is much better to me at least. So what's the point to have a, discussion integrated in the mailing list. So maybe we should start from the beginning, right? The mailing lists are indeed not used much, really. There's once in a time, there's some question from some user and most of the traffic uh, is about the RCs and the new releases. Sometimes someone like Keith replies there that uh, he tested the release. Thanks for that, by the way. Uh, but there's like the GitHub discussions are much busier place, right? <clears throat> that said, I mean, if someone wants to use the mailing list, then they should use it and start asking there. I think every question which we got on the mailing list, we always answered and replied to. So it's not like we are ignoring the mailing list. The fact that the users choose to use different things such as Slack or GitHub discussions over mailing list. Like what should we do about it? Should we close the GitHub discussions and the Slack channel just so that they are forced to use mailing list? I don't think that's really our task or the only sorry Paolo go no sorry I was just saying the only drawback of um, so we we know that there are people use issues discussions which are really good because uh, so they are uh, there is a storage for that, right? So anyway, when you have a similar problem, you can find and you can search and find the solution instead of asking questions. Uh, the problem uh, actually is with Slack sometimes where uh, you ask for a questions or you have an issue, then uh, yeah, there is Jakub helping you. And then it's much more difficult for the other to search for the answer if they have the same problems. So while so, with Slack, you can have an help in real time. So I, I don't want to say that Slack should not be used, of course. But anyway, so I, uh, there is something in Kafka like this. I don't think that Kafka is a, as a chat where people can ask questions or it's used as much as the, 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 the mailing list. I think Confluent have their own Slack where they cover, cover a lot of the general questions as well, or? No, there's, there's a Slack server from Apache. Uh, there's a Kafka channel where we have a few hundred or thousand people, um, but it, it's, it's not managed by the PNC or I mean, uh, as per the Apache guidelines, the uh, discussion should happen on the mailing list in priority. Um, so there's a few discussions in the Slack channel, but uh, 
Uh, it's pretty much an easy. There's no announcement, so there's nothing official. So it seems that in Kafka, the users prefer to use the mailing list, right? I don't know if they prefer, but, but uh, this is what we do. I think it's also historically. Yeah. That's what always been there. Slack wasn't there, right? We started yeah. much, much later. And with different time, we started with different tools. Ahmed, you raised your hand. There was uh, Simon that was talking. Yeah, I was just going to say specifically around proposals, people can subscribe to the proposals repository and be notified when there are new um, new PRs to that repository. Ahmed? Yeah, um, typically, I think we should just uh, look at this, that there are different people that are used to different kind of communities. There are communities that are more or less around Slack and Gitter and whatever, and other communities that are around mailing lists and emails and stuff. And I've went before into a big discussions around to move people from this side to the other side, and there are You'll, you'll always find a split. Some people have different preferences there. Um, so I think what's happening right now is more or less sufficient that announcements are made and questions are being answered on the mailing list and people are able to find help. Probably someone who's asking if they are not part of the maintainers, I would say, or asking for mailing lists, is just looking for a way to hook into what is going on in the community. And the way that this community is having, like sharing what's going on is on GitHub and Slack. So I don't think we're at the stage where we can cater for everybody in my humble but opinion. What do you mean with sharing what's going on? Like uh, have in their mailing lists, emails happening with people saying hey oh, we're gonna work on this feature somebody like like when you i don't know subscribe to to the kernel mailing list or to um, um fedora mailing dev mailing list you see people don't go on a on a slack and saying hey i carried this pull request or something they just send an email around such stuff and probably some people want to have the same experience and i think that's available by github yeah, well, I mean, to be honest, we don't do that for the others either, right? We don't start a discussion when we open a PR. We don't advertise it on Slack when we open a PR. If you want to be notified about the PRs, you can subscribe to that via GitHub and you get the notifications. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's so exactly. GitHub notifications for PRs questions, discussions, issues, etc. And yeah, I think that's the main even more than Slack. Like Slack is also some some sort of supporting the user in the community. So I would say that the yeah source of truth of what's happening in Streamzy is GitHub, basically. If you need support, then you have Slack and and mailing lists. Yeah, and to be honest, if you prefer mail, then like you can subscribe to the discussions, you can subscribe to the issues from GitHub. I don't think they like it would be great to have the discussions work as a mailing list as well. But I don't think you can kind of integrate it directly into the user mailing list, for example. They are simply separate and GitHub doesn't support it. So so I don't think that's something where we can do it with with pressing some some buttons. Yeah. Like for the proposals, 
the I don't know. That's that's the part which kind of I can see some sense of it if we want to try to make the mailing list a bit busier place to have some rule to kind of announce new proposal on the mailing list and direct the discussions on GitHub. <laughs> Is it really worth it? I don't know. Maybe also to share where, where I'm coming from, which is related to what you're saying. Like, I think that's that's not the most critical thing when it comes to under like how can we improve this aspect from here. Like, I, you can imagine that the next thing, like you, you could you could be in a situation where the maintainers are the people who are asking for that, which is a situation that I that I was in before. Like half of the maintainers are asking for mailing lists and stuff and the other half are asking for slack and that, that i think that's that's a valuable discussion to have but right now if 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 all the maintainers are able to do their job giving the stuff that are happening and the user so it's important to understand what is the user looking for are you are you looking for a way to tap into the proposals and stuff like that or are you asking us to move our own discussions to the mailing list. And I think in, 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 in both cases, we have answers for you right now. Yeah. As you said, we definitely can do that, but uh, in my humble opinion, um, th that's, that's, that's not the most pressing, that's not the most, uh, like the, what, what will move the needle when it comes to involvement and stuff if it's if it's gonna add overhead on people yeah anyone anything else on this topic Okay, so I guess that means we are done with the survey questions. So next on the agenda, open forum questions and issues. Does anyone has anything to raise? Did we ever had someone raise something for this? Okay, then we also have some issues or PRs which are hanging there for some time, which we should probably discuss. So one of them is this old from July PR around Topic operator stuff from from Liam. I guess we should close it. Tom, any thoughts on that? Um, can I mean I did actually look at this um, like in the last couple of weeks actually. Um, and I think, I think what I'm planning in the topic operator is going to go in a different direction to this. But can we uh, not close it just yet? Um, and maybe come back to it in a couple of weeks or a month, and maybe close it then, depending on how um, how the investigations that I'm doing pan out. Okay, next one is the operator shutdown hook. So I don't know if anyone has any votes on that. Yeah, I mean, this is tricky. Um, 
in the sense that the operators ought to be crash safe. So if we go adding a shutdown hook, then we're actually just making it harder for ourselves to detect if they're not, because most of the time they would shut down cleanly um, and do whatever tidy up that they needed to do that they shouldn't need to do, if you see what I mean. So um, I think there is actually sense in, in not, um, not improving this. So Which kind of seems to... weird, right? But, uh, I think so, yeah. Okay. Then the next one is about some fix to the Grafana dashboard where to be honest, I don't understand Grafana well enough to know what it does and the guy who opened it it didn't seem to me like he understands it either he just found something what fixed it for him so he opened the pr but i personally have no idea if this is really something what is a fix and makes sense or if this is something what fixes it for one guy and breaks it for five other guys so yeah i have no idea what to do with this i can look into this i can look into this you understand grafana pretty much <laughs> okay great Thanks. And so the last one is from Federico about the call backup script and what really raised this discussion is that he actually changed the readme and he basically says, oh, hey, this is a tool for backups in test or development clusters which makes me kind of wonder so i personally don't not sure i understand the value of such a backup tool for development and test I can understand that it's not completely perfect solution for production, but if it works for someone to do backup over weekend where everything can be shut down or something, then yeah, at least someone, but I'm not sure I understood the value of this for test and development. And given we have a lot of other work elsewhere, the question is, do we really want to keep this and maintain this for backing up test and development clusters? So it's not as much about the, about the PR itself as it is about kind of, does the tool really make sense if it's not, not really something we recommend to use in production, even if all the kind of limitations are fine for the user. Anyone has any thoughts about it?
Yeah, I mean, unless it's the sort of a, a slightly more elaborated um, explanation for how we expect people to use this for, you know, testing and development purposes, then I agree it looks like it's quite a lot of code to then sort of have to test and could well sort of bit rot. So I think unless Federico can uh, come up with that sort of more detailed explanation as to sort of what the use case is, rather than just, uh, you know, kind of seems like it could be useful, or, you know, we've used something like this on a handful of occasions, then I guess I'd be in favor of closing it. But if you can come up with that, then I'd, you know, be prepared to have a look at it. Okay, so Like this? Does it make sense? Yep, that looks good. Okay. So, uh, I think there were two proposals just merged. One was about the filtering of the labels on the Kafka user resources, and the other one was about the about the configuration of the client examples. So I don't think there is anything open that should be discussed unless someone wants to raise something. which leaves us with the issue triage. We have eight minutes to the end, but maybe we can start with at least some of them. So the first one is uh, about the bug, which keeps so where basically the exception from I think creating the key store is basically ignored. And it caused the pot to be rolled. Uh, in this case, the exception happened because there's no space left on the device because the temp directory was full. But I guess that's a bug and should be, should be fixed. Either by, I don't know, raising the exception and not rolling the brokers or something like that, I guess. Yeah, sorry, I'm struggling to remember the details of this now to talk coherently about it. It's been it's been quite a while since that was raised. But yeah. yes, broadly, I, I, I agree. 
Okay. Right. And I remember that at that time I checked the code and it definitely looked like it's missing some checks for it. Uh, so I guess we remove the needs triage, we keep the buck. I don't know. I'm if sure we'll, we'll be able to give some attention to, to this whilst we're looking at other Kafka roller issues. Yeah, I think, I think it's a buck and it probably should be fixed rather than giving it some good start or help wanted labels. The second issue described here, to be honest, doesn't seem to be related. It comes from a different place. So I think that should be handled in a separate issue. So I took a note of this and uh, we'll look into it, see if it makes sense to fix after mine, if it's like around the same stuff. If it's not, then yeah, I'll... Like if it is, I'll assign myself and just fix it. Okay, uh, sorry, Ahmed, you said I should assign it to you. Uh, so I, I will check it out first okay. if it's like in the same area. And I can just like yeah, create a separate pull request after mine, which is also another bug in the rolling. Then I'll just assign myself and fix it right away. Okay, 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 great. And I close the list of the issues which need triage. So the other one is uh, around the Kafka Connect build and how it used the custom repository which to be honest, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make much sense. So on the paper, we have this feature for adding a custom Maven repository when using the Kafka Connect build and pulling custom artifacts. But what it really does is it basically uses this custom repository to pull the, the single pom.xml file and then tries to run it as a from Maven Central, and that doesn't work, right? If you pull, for example, I think here it was some Confluent Maven repository, you cannot just pull some Confluent JDBC connector pom.xml from the Confluent repository, and then try to pull all the artifacts it refers to from Maven Central, because the artifacts are probably 99% cases will be located, at least some of them, in the same repository and not in Maven Central. So to be honest, this seems like something what uh, never worked. And I personally don't understand any value of it. So that seems like something screwed up when it was developed. And that seems like something what should be I a bit hesitant to say fixed because yeah, in a way it's a fix to something what we seemingly support today, but it basically means it should be properly implemented. So I think that's a fair issue. Or anyone sees it differently? Yeah, it sounds like this is something that we should just fix. So, so 
So I guess the question is, it's probably not a good start. Should we mark it as a help wanted? Yeah, I, I guess it doesn't seem like it's so very difficult. We have to generate a Maven settings XML file and get the Maven commands that we execute to use that. That doesn't seem like it's rocket science to me. So. Okay. Okay, and with that, I think we are at the end of the time. So the rest of the triage will be in two weeks. Anyone has anything else before we close the call? If not, then thanks for joining and see you around on Slack, GitHub, mailing list, uh, or <laughs> here. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks, Jakob. Thanks, folks. Bye now. Bye.